Good morning and welcome to ITS Asia Pacific Conference Special Interest Session. Our topic today is High Fidelity IoT Sensors, Edge Computing and AI for Traffic Analytics. Welcome to those attending in person and also welcome to those joining virtually. I'm Andrea Ash and I will be moderating this session. When I'm not moderating, I am Head of Marketing at Coda Wireless with a focus on how we make our roads safer, smarter and greener. I believe this is a common focus for all of us. We know how dangerous our roads can be with someone losing their life every 25 seconds. We know the negative impacts of congestion to all road users' productivity and the negative impact of pollution on our environment. Cities and road operators work feverishly to improve road safety and reduce congestion so that the experience provided to all road users is safer and more enjoyable. In this session, we discuss the need for higher fidelity data and how value can be delivered now, which will also prepare our roads for the future of CITS. Allow me to introduce our panellists. Firstly, we have Claire Thurston joining us from Transport for New South Wales. We also have Paul Gray from Coda Wireless. And to round it out, we have Simon Young from Cisco Systems. Please submit your questions in the virtual platform, and these will be answered at the end during our live Q&A. You can also contact the speaker through direct message on the virtual platform. Okay, so Claire's gonna lead us off today, talking about the need for intelligent sensors and smart cities and the current challenges that exist. Firstly, a little bit about Claire. Claire Thurston is the director of the Sydney Coordinated Adaptive Traffic System, also known as SCAPS, the world's leading intelligent transport systems platform owned and developed by the New South Wales government. Claire oversees the full spectrum of product development for SCAPS from research and development to delivery, including commercial release. Prior to her appointment as director of SCAPS, Claire held a range of strategic advisory and business transformation roles in the New South Wales government including three years as Chief Advisor to Roads and Maritime Services Chief Executive. Claire, I'm now going to bring up your presentation. Thank you, Andrea, for that warm um, introduction. Filming in advance is providing a great opportunity for us all to test our Zoom schools. So I'll just wait for Andrea to bring up my slides. Okay. Thank you. Yep, coming up. You should be able to see it now. Okay. Go. Perfect. That's great. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, I think there's a lot of currency um, to this topic. Um, in the in intelligence sensors market is moving very, very quickly um, and, and evolving at, at a rapid rate, much like the ITS industry. Um, as part of the ITS Asia Pacific Forum, Transport for New South Wales is launching its future transport technology roadmap. The technology roadmap is transport's headline customer facing transport technology strategy, and it outlines our ambitions and program of work against six key priority areas to deliver a world class transport system and customer experience. One of those is intelligent sensors. On screen though, are all six of our key priorities. The first being mobility as a service. Mass will deliver seamless and personalized journeys across all modes. New South Wales is also working to be a world leading adopter of connected and automated vehicles by 2024. A rapid transition to zero emission buses and electric vehicles will also help New South Wales reach its net zero emissions target by 2050. Technology to transform mobility in regional New South Wales is also a key priority for us, together with more efficient freight to help drive our economy. And finally, sensors and intelligence systems will create smart transport networks. And that's what I really wanna focus on um, for my time in talking with you this morning. Our program of work on intelligence sensors is a key component to the success of our strategy. We know intelligence sensors will enable richer customer information, improved service performance, and faster incident response. 
Tomorrow's sensors solve a range of today's challenges. Tomorrow's sensors can provide information on road users, uh, distinguish between um, a motor vehicle, a, a pedestrian, a cyclist, and also help classify vehicles. Today's sensors can't really differentiate between um, a car, a bus, um, or a truck, nor the length of those vehicles. Cannot determine vehicle speed, um, nor queue length, and the impact that that queue length might be having, having on up or downstream congestion. Provides limited information on anonymized um, origin and destination information to help um, better manage and plan and coordinate our overall network. Um, it also um, um, can be challenging in terms of anomaly detection, so when incidents or accidents um, occur on our network. Richer information we don't have, as I said, with a range of our existing data sources. Richer information that we can apply machine learning to um, and artificial intelligence capability to improve the decision-making algorithms in our network management platforms like SCATS, which is used in many of our cities around Australia. Richer insights to improve predictability and response times. Um, and richer insights, importantly, to the comment that Andrea made in her opening um, to support safety outcomes is vitally important. With the market moving so quickly and with a wide range of augmented sensors available, Transport for New South Wales is working very closely um, with industry, including partners such as CODA um, and Cisco to test, trial and learn and help us make an informed decision about the best sensors for deployment um, on our networks and importantly, the best sensors to integrate with our existing transport management systems, such as SCATS. I'll now hand back to Andrea, who will introduce our next speakers, who will speak to talk to the sensors in a little bit more detail and in their, importantly, in their own context. And I'll jump back in a bit later to round out the conversation. Thanks, Andrea. Perfect. Thank you so much, Claire. I think that sets a really good foundation for today's special interest session. Okay, so our next speaker is Paul Gray. Paul will take us through the availability of high fidelity data and what insights this can provide with immediate value and at the same time preparing our roads for the future of V2X. Paul is the CEO of Coda Wireless. He started at Coda as the chief engineer laying the foundations for CODA's groundbreaking automotive and smart cities projects. Paul's tenure at the helm has positioned CODA as the globally recognised brand for connected vehicles, connected autonomous vehicles and smart city infrastructure. He came to CODA after six years in San Diego, working as CTO and business manager with a wireless tech startup. So welcome, Paul, if you can please share your presentation. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. So I'll be speaking mostly about the sensor side of uh, uh, the systems that uh, we need to have deployed. And so, you know, to start with, you know, let's focus in on cooperative ITS systems. Uh, I think this slide sort of is probably something most of you are familiar with. It really, you know, talks about what the future cooperative ITS systems will look like when they're fully deployed. In in essence, there are a network of IoT sensors, which are really sharing data from, from the onboard units installed in every vehicle, and these be installed in production vehicles. And, and by using vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications to share that sensor data be, be, between vehicles, uh, we're able to generate collision warnings for potential hazardous situations, a whole range of applications, uh, as well as situational awareness of what pedestrians and other vulnerable road users are doing uh, via uh, vehicle to pedestrian or V2P communications. Meanwhile, that whole network of vehicles is also integrated into the uh, uh, traffic management systems via roadside units, which are installed in intersections and along roadways, uh, which then communicate with the vehicles via you know, vehicle to infrastructure communications. Yeah, you know, so this is a very rich um, you know, set of sensors, uh, really, and delivering some quite significant potential benefits. You know, ranging from uh, significantly improving the safety of our roads, 
uh, reducing congestion and having traffic flow more freely, uh, as well as uh, environmental impact um, benefits by reducing the, 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 you know, the amount of CO2 emissions, for example, that are coming from all these vehicles on the roads. Um, however, this, whilst this is starting to be deployed, we have, you know, VW in, in Europe has now released the Golf 8, which has got uh, these cooperative ITS systems on board, and, and Coda, incidentally, is providing the, all the software that goes into those vehicles. Uh, we're seeing uh, large deployments around the world of, of roadside units uh, in the infrastructure, you know, ranging from New York City to Hamburg, and even here in Australia, we have quite a significant um, pilot under the way uh, up in Ipswich at the moment, uh, which is uh, really examining the performance of such systems with around 300 vehicles on the road. Um, however, this, these systems and fully deployed uh, or deployed to enough density to really deliver these benefits has been slow to reach a tipping point. And uh, the reason for that is really, you know, in essence, the chicken or egg dilemma which has slowed the deployment significantly. And in, in essence, it's, well, you know, road off authorities are asking themselves, well, why would we deploy, deploy infrastructure today when there's no vehicles out on the roads yet? Likewise, the car makers themselves are saying, well, you know, is there really value in putting these systems in, or value to our customers in putting these systems into vehicles, you know, when there's no infrastructure out there yet for them to talk to? Um, plus, we've got some you know, further slowdown in deployment, uh, resulting from lots and lots of debate about what's the best technology to deploy uh, in these vehicles in these roadside. And so, you know, that's been a dilemma for a company like Coda. It's like, you know, we, we want, want this to be deployed. We can see the benefits of it. You know, but you know, so we started really thinking, you know, how can we break this, this vicious circle? in terms of you know, getting these systems deployed and starting to deliver these you know, safety, mobility and environmental um, benefits to, um, uh, to the community. And that led us to really you know, rethinking the, the system slightly. Uh, in essence, you know, what we started thinking about is, well, we can move all the smarts from the vehicles themselves um, into the roadside infrastructure running on an edge processor, for example, which will be co-located with the roadside units. And likewise, we don't have to wait for uh, you know, you know, V2X transmitters to be installed in all these vehicles, because today, you know, most of these vehicles have actually already got transmitters in them in, in the form of Wi-Fi enabled smartphones, which uh, a, a majority of the vehicles on the road already have uh, in them, essentially the, the, the devices being carried by the drivers. And uh, likewise, uh, uh, vulnerable road users like pedestrians and cyclists uh, are often carrying these devices as well. So if we can switch the, um, the signaling from the standard V2X signaling to the Wi-Fi signaling and at the same time move a lot of the smart, such as the location uh, engine and the threat detection engine, to the edge, we can actually unlock quite a lot of benefits today. And what we're able to do is really track these vehicles and um, pedestrians and cyclists and so on it, with high fidelity in real time as they move through the intersection and then deliver some um, immediate benefits. So essentially, this is what the, you know, the, uh, the architecture would look, look like in practice. We have roadside units in, uh, deployed in infrastructure, which are able to monitor the signals coming from uh, the, uh, the smartphones being carried by pedestrians and drivers. And these can just be anonymous smartphones. We don't need to have any applications running on uh, on those um, devices, and you know, through those that signaling, we're able to track the vehicles um, you know, in uh, in real time as they move through the intersection, and then feed that into an edge processor, which is also located at the roadside, and really start to add some um, significant uh, you know, value add, you know, right at this roadside you know, in terms of uh, you know a range of applications, and then that data in turn can be fed to you know, the back office, you know, be that, you know, be that a, a traffic management center or the SCAT system or, or so on. So some, we can start creating some quite rich and valuable data coming from the roadside today. And likewise, if we wanted to push um, alerts and messages back to uh, road users, we can also do support that via an opt-in app um, that, you know, they can, uh, you know, optionally be carrying, uh, be installing these devices. But the 
I think the one of the strongest features of, of this solution is it's the fact that it's future proof because the roadside units, as well as you know being able to monitor the Wi-Fi signals, can also um, communicate with V2X enabled connected vehicles when they finally hit the road. That means we have a solution here that is is ready for those um, vehicles when they start rolling out, and so we don't have to you know wait until those um, connected vehicles start rolling out on the road to create some benefits, but we're ready for when they are. Likewise, you know the you know the solution can also be integrated with 5G systems and so on. These connected cars in the future are also going to be 5G enabled, and so there's a range of you know applications that can be supported just through some software upgrades for these systems. Um, looking at more of a, a functional view of um, the solution, you know, obviously, you know, on the left here we have, you know, the connected either anonymous uh, mobile devices being carried by pedestrians and drivers, you know, communicating with the, the roadside unit via Wi-Fi. Likewise, you know, in the future we can have connected vehicles there with a, you know, with a much richer, you know, set of sensors and and you know, more importantly, you know interaction with either the drivers of manual vehicles or with the automated systems of future autonomous vehicles. That's all communicating by the roadside unit. And then we have a range of software that gets installed right at the edge there and you know, running on some uh, Cisco edge nodes. And so that includes the location engine, which is responsible for tracking these vehicles and, and uh, uh, road users they move through the intersection, which is great because we can also run, instead of running the threat detection engine, which we'd, we'd normally install in the vehicle itself, we can actually run that from the edge as well and actually identify some some quite unique and uh, uh, and important insights into the, what the traffic is doing so we can not only be de detecting you know collisions um, uh, between vehicles but we will also be detecting near misses both between vehicles and between vehicles and pedestrians so that you know really you know creates a rich set of data that can be fed back to the you know traffic management center or to, to third parties and so on Another beauty of doing this, uh, adding these, some of these features at the edge, we can start building privacy by design straight into the system. So all the data being collected from the roadside can be uh, anonymized and aggregated before being passed out, out of these uh, or up into the cloud. And so that really increasing, increases privacy and security. Um, likewise, we're, we're, because we're doing some, a lot of processing at the edge, it really reduces the amount of data or the, it, it filters the data in essence to only the, the valuable data that can be fed into these you know, artificial intelligence-based systems in, in, in the cloud. So when there's, there's probably little value and it's not very scalable if we were to pass you know, in real time the movement you know, of every vehicle and every pedestrian that, it, that is out on the road network up into the cloud. That would just simply um, be too much data and it won't be scalable. But you know, with this sort of um, distributed architecture, we can really you know, you know, um, you know, add some value to the data right at the edge and only pass the, you know, for example, you know, the, you know, not don't pass every near road user interaction up up to the to the cloud, but only uh, pass the ones which we're concerned about. You know, the sort of the near misses and the like. So that that really you know helps to build a much more scalable system. So this system today can deliver quite a range of use cases. Uh, first and foremost is that of road user behaviour. So looking at how uh, traffic and pedestrians are behaving on the roads. And that uh, you know, can be lane level traffic flow, lane level queue links, near miss detection between vehicles, or even for um, uh, in our cities, pedestrian flow, density density, pedestrian density, as well as you know, um, improving vulnerable road user safety. Then out on motorways and in tunnels, for example, we can start, we can you know, leverage the system to do high fidelity automatic uh, incident detection. So creating lane level average speeds, um, doing stopped vehicle um, detection and creating stopped vehicle alerts, identifying wrong way drivers, and even you know, identifying near misses at on ramps and off ramps to really, you know, you know, get an understanding of the, the safety of our roads. Then, you know, into the, you know, more firmly into the tunnels or even indeed in urban canyons, we can uh, be assisting for, you know, more accurate navigation. Uh, and it, it is true to say that, you know, our ability to, you know, get this accurate vehicle position is really quite um, 
powerful. So we, we can do, uh, you know, lane level accurate positioning or even indeed, indeed sub-meter accuracy in urban canyons or in road tunnels, which is certainly accurate enough for connected autonomous vehicles when they start hitting the road as well. And then a couple of other, you know, you know, recent applications that we've been exploring as well is using the system to uh, for people counting, so counting the number of people on board a bus, train, or tram to understand how how uh, how full the, the the bus is, for example, to you know give some insights into um, you know uh, uh, rider density, you know counting number of people in, in taxi queues, and even applying it in station platforms, uh, at train stations, for example, and understanding not only you know the number of people who may be on board a particular platform. But also understanding the flow of people in and out of the um, the train station, and finally, we're also exploring uh, the use of the system for free flow entry and exit at car parks, for example. So, if you have a you know a, a car parking app, uh, you can you know potentially just drive straight into a car park and have the boom gate open automatically, and just you know speeding that flow in and out of the car parks, and even in in the future you know, supporting things like valet parking for um, autonomous vehicles. So you can just leave your vehicle at the entrance and have it park itself. So a good range of, of applications and, and use cases that we can support today. But as I mentioned earlier, we also have the, uh, uh, you know, the ability to ha you know, support cooperative ITS and all of those uh, future use cases. So, you know, we're not really, you know, having to decide here, you know, and, and we're not, we're able to deploy a system that can create some value today, but also still be ready for the future, going through the, the initial day one uh, uh, use cases for, for awareness driving uh, through to day two, which is sensor, sensor driving through cooperative perception and collective perception and, and starting to support all those um, uh, uh, use cases as, as the level of automation of vehicles goes up through to day three and beyond where we're moving into you know, cooperative driving and even fully automated driving. So this whole range of use cases that, you know, is the, the promise of future of um, connected and connected autonomous vehicles is still supported by the system. So, you know, we can really get ourselves ready for these and hopefully just have a, um, um, some, some firmware upgrades and software upgrades to the system to support these as they roll out. So this is quite a, uh, a unique sensor, we believe, which you know, offers you know, some significant benefits over some of the existing sensors out there. So there's a range of low, low granularity or low fidelity sensors that are out there, from traffic loops to infrared beams, you know, uh, Bluetooth, and even radar and camera. Uh, I guess by by low low fidelity here for the radar and camera, I'm just talking about a single single camera, for example, which obviously you know. Is, is a good sensor, but it's not going to give you that real high fidelity. To move to a high fidelity traffic sensor with some of these existing system, systems like cameras and lidars, you need multiple um, units deployed and to really get a good view of the road. Um, and uh, you know, and but of course, the the more of these sensors you need to deploy to get this high fidelity, um, you need. Uh, it's just going to come at expense. Whereas, you know, the locate IQ system is is high fidelity, uh, and it 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 can work in all weathers. It can uh, you know, it, it it can work in non-liner situations. So, you know, the the sensing is not blocked by trucks or you know at long range or anything like that. Um, but I think a couple of other you know items which are, which are quite unique to locate IQ. Uh, is, is first of all, it can detect road user interactions, which is really quite a, a unique for, for sensors. Um, we're not really you know, just looking at ind vehicles individually, we're looking at how they interact with each other. And I think more importantly, uh, one of the biggest values is, is that of the fact that it's future-proof. But that said, because we're doing all this at the edge, you know, yeah, we're not we don't need to, uh, it's not an either or question about other sensors. So if there are other sensors that are out there that really can add value um, to the, uh, the full solution, then that can be easily fused in with a sensor fusion layer in the edge processor. So it, it really is possible to uh, deploy these systems and you know, really you know, get, get the most benefit from these, um, all the sensing technologies that are out there. 
So I guess in conclusion, uh, you know, we we really feel that with Locate OQ, we've we've broken this chicken or egg dilemma. We've we've got a solution that that can be deployed today and deliver some immediate benefits, which is essentially, you know, creating high fidelity real time traffic data and some actual actionable insights coming from that data. But yet the system is still future proofed. You know, it's it. Uh, it, it's ready for those CITS and connected autonomous vehicles when they finally hit the road. It's also um, technology agnostic in a way because the, the hardware which we deploy, such as the MK6 uh, unit, which is shown here, it supports DSRC, it supports CV2X, it supports Wi-Fi, it supports Bluetooth, it supports 5G. Uh, and so really it, it's not a matter of, you know, you're not left wondering, is this the right technology to deploy? Uh, because it's a flexible solution that can be deployed today and be ready, you know, it can be agile as to whatever, uh, you know, and transpires as, as the years go by. And as I mentioned earlier, it really is a unique IoT traffic sensor. It works in all weather, it can work at long range. Importantly, it can work in non-line of sight conditions. It's not blocked by, blocked by trucks or overpasses or you know, any other um, uh, occlusion that might be out there in the roads. And, you know, and I think you know, critically, it, it, it can, can be monitoring road user interactions and really create some, um, some really unique insights into the, what, what the traffic is doing. So it's a great um, solution to be feeding into uh, uh, back office systems. So thanks. I'll, I'll throw you back to Andrea now. So thank you so much, Paul. Um, it was great to be able to share out with the participants here of the special interest session, um, Locate IQ, and, uh, and you know, a, a solution that really does break the chicken and the egg dilemma and, uh, and, as you mentioned, offering immediate value now. So thank you. Now, moving on to our next panellist, Simon Young. Simon uh, works very closely with the market and understands the challenges mentioned um, by Claire earlier. He will share how Cisco is addressing these gaps in the marketplace and the importance of making decisions at the edge. A little bit about Simon. Simon is the general manager for the transport and infrastructure market in Australia and New Zealand as part of the strategic industries development group at Cisco. Simon is responsible for helping customers and partners define and deliver new digital businesses through innovative go-to-market models and technology engagement methodologies, leveraging deep industry expertise and a clear digital transformation platform. He is helping customers seize the opportunities of tomorrow by providing that amazing things can happen when connecting the previously unconnected. Simon has driven transformational initiatives across various sales and engineering roles during his 16 years with Cisco, including developing and leading the Internet of Things IoT business across Australia and New Zealand. So welcome, Simon, and I will open up for your presentation. Great. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, let me just open this up. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Building up on what Paul uh, discussed earlier around sensors, I'm going to talk a little bit about edge computing, and then we'll take you through a bit of a trial which pulls together the pieces around sensors, edge computing, and artificial intelligence. So the first thing to, to talk about in terms of edge computing is why edge computing? What are some of the advantages and why would people do edge um, computing? And uh, I'm going to run through some of those reasons. So one of them is around network bandwidth. Uh, quite often, there may not be ample bandwidth um, where the sensors are situated. Uh, perhaps when we're talking about high fidelity sensors, there's too much data. Uh, so that could be a, a cost issue. So one of the reasons for, for going down the path of edge computing is to reduce the amount of uh, data uh, and therefore uh, reduce the costs or at least uh, help save on network bandwidth. Um, the other point around edge computing is maybe some of the data is not interesting. You may have some high fidelity sensors and might, might be sending it uh, to the cloud or to the data center. But uh, in most situations, we find not all of it is important where everyone wants to collect it. Um, you may not need to action it uh, as soon as possible. So having that ability to filter it based upon what's interesting 
is really important. And to do that at the edge, again, goes back to the point around saving bandwidth and the amount of data going back, uh, being um, sent back to, to a cloud or a data center. Latency optimization, again, really important for safety critical situations. Uh, if you need to make a change or alert someone uh, of a situation, then you may not want to have that latency associated with sending that data all the way to the cloud or the data center, a decision being made and then going all the way back and then back to alerting uh, that particular object. So being able to make those decisions as quick as you can, right at the edge, right where that center data is generated is really useful, particularly again for, for safety critical situations. Um, data redirection based on the content of the data. Uh, again, as we start to see customers build out uh, support for multiple cloud platforms, uh, multiple destinations, uh, maybe they wanna send some data to uh, certain destinations, other data to other destinations, we're seeing a strong need for governance at the edge. Again, uh, can you make decisions? Can you uh, make a decision about where to send that data? All that is occurring now at the edge. Uh, and that might be for also for privacy reasons as, as well. Perhaps we don't need to send um, all the uh, particular data to one location to be processed. Uh, we can manage that uh, again uh, locally at the edge. Data normalization, application simplification. Um, when we're looking at taking sensors and, and bringing them in uh, to the network, we might have legacy-based sensors, we might have data that's of, of varying types of protocols. Um, we might have simple things like uh, you might have temperature in Celsius, one in Fahrenheit, how do you manage it so that that gets changed and normalized so it's easy to consume? Uh, perhaps if we think about this from a northbound perspective, we don't want lots of different protocols uh, going to a backend system. We want a simple uh, way to interface into this. So again, the role of edge compute is to provide that data, norm data normalization capability and make it nice and easy to access that data. Uh, and finally, is around creating uh, application agility. Uh, instead of building siloed solutions at the edge and, and bespoke and discrete solutions, uh, what we're seeing really is uh, the, the ability to remove the connectivity between sensors and applications and having that agility to build new applications and push them out on top of the uh, edge platform to make use of those uh, of that new data streams uh, in, in situ. So there's some of the advantages around edge compute and, and there's some of the challenges that we're seeing out in the market for why uh, people are turning to edge uh, computing to help uh, support uh, their uh, data requirements, connectivity requirements, decision-making uh, requirements as well. Um, and some people might be asking, okay, well, aren't we just putting out a compute platform uh, in all sorts of locations next to sensors and all that? Well, it's a little bit more than that, um, because if you look at existing uh, compute platforms, there's a lot of things associated with it. It, it. You've got to look after the hardware, you have to patch uh, the underlying operating system, there might be device management, there might be application management, and it becomes quite complex. We don't want that. We don't want to have lots and lots of boxes that were now multiplied and increased that the management um, plane. Uh, and so along with the actual physical device and, and the capabilities, uh, we're also ensuring that the platform is easy to use, easy to manage, and of course secure because a lot of these locations where they're installed uh, might not be, might be in the middle of nowhere, might be at remote locations, might be um, accessible. Uh, and so we're really advocating that it's not just a compute platform put out uh, on the edge in remote locations is a bit more around it in terms of the framework and the support structure uh, around an edge platform as well. So let's go through uh, an example uh, of what uh, what we, we're talking about in terms of the edge. Uh, here's a, a roadways use case, again, uh, to tie back to what Paul was talking about. We're using some high fidelity sensors uh, here, it happens to be from Coda, and we're, we're using Wi-Fi to detect uh, the vehicle on, on the road. And so on the right-hand side, you can see some of the capabilities that are now um, uh, being uh, accessed from the edge. You've got the, the device. This happens to be an IC3000 from Cisco. It's providing connectivity uh, to the sensors. The data coming out of it is first being normalized. So we've got a, a clean, um, consistent way to access the position of the cars, which the sensor has detected, the speed of the car, um, and the direction of the car. Um, we then have that capability to install and 
place applications uh, at that edge, again, to manage that data flow and, and maybe to turn it into an outcome. Again, we're using uh, an application here from Coda and that's turning all that data from those sensors into uh, meaningful uh, output and information. Now through that data, we can determine perhaps the queue length of the vehicle, um, which lane is it entering and exiting on, uh, and even to the point of understanding clearing time, how long does it take before that vehicle uh, leaves that intersection where the light turns from red to green. And then it can go beyond that. So here's a governance piece. How do we take the process data uh, the outcome from that application and push it out so that it can be ingested by other systems, other dashboards, uh, perhaps even other decision-making platforms as well. So that's a great example of what we can do. That's a great example of pulling together the sensors and the edge platforms. Um, now let's talk about something that's, that's real and that we actually uh, built and, and the outcomes from that. So this is why we have such strong partnerships with Transport for New South Wales and Coda Wireless. We decided to take this concept collectively and test it in the real life situation. And that's what we've done. We've actually built out a trial in Sydney at the top of Pitt Street to see if we could use these concepts to help get a better uh, insight into behavior on the road, not just from a vehicle perspective, but from a vulnerable road user perspective as well. And so these are the different elements that are, are there as part of the trial. Um, there's a camera out there. Uh, we are using artificial intelligence to understand uh, behavior, again, to recognize the type of vehicles uh, that are being used at that intersection and perhaps even some high risk um, activity. Uh, but for the sake of today's presentation, we're focusing on that bottom element there. Again, there's those Coda wireless RSUs deployed at the intersection, and we're using that Wi-Fi messages from devices that people might have on them, their phones, their the watches, uh, even a tablet, the little Wi-Fi messages going, hello, is there a, an access point around? And then the Coda wireless RSU determines that location um, in a very granular manner. It's all getting processed at the edge, and that all sits in that roadside cabinet um, being processed. Again, great um, in terms of reducing that data set, great in terms of making a decision very quickly and reducing latency, and great from a privacy perspective because we're only sending northbound out to the dashboard that process data. Um, and that's sort of what it looks like from the from the from the top. We have a number of RSUs installed. A uh, bit of an old picture that there's there's obviously a brand new light rail that goes through there, not not a, a big open pit. Um, and we use five RSUs to help determine uh, the number the vehicles uh, at that intersection as well. Um, from uh, uh, from I guess a hardware perspective. Uh, this is what's installed in the cabinet. Not everything is being used as part of this trial. Most importantly is in the bottom right hand corner, the little square box, that's actually the edge compute um, uh, platform. Uh, and so you can see it's quite small, uh, but provides that all that capability that we spoke about uh, earlier. Okay. So let, let's look at some results. So this is uh, this is the video running of the idea of uh, of the objects that we've been able to target, um, and you can see uh, the objects moving across in, in real time. In fact, uh, you can see quite broadly uh, traditional sensors, traditional sensor sense, other sensors may ha have problems seeing all the way around uh, the intersection. Think video surveillance. Um, but here we're getting quite a granular view. I think in this particular trial, we're seeing 400 meters in either direction. So this is up and down Pitt Street uh, and, and Eddie Avenue. Uh, and you can see the vehicles at the lane level. You can see them stopping. You can see them turning. Uh, it's quite intuitive in terms of being able to understand the behavior of all the road users. So light rail vehicle goes across. We can see that people bunching up on the side of the road, pedestrians uh, waiting to cross the light. We, we can see that. Uh, and that provides a, a good little, lot of detail to help understand what's happening right now in real time, but more importantly as well, trends over time and perhaps even changes over time as well. Um, and so in order to demonstrate it as well, we, we, we built a little dashboard. This is just for demonstration purposes. But again, you can see this in real time. Um, Again, not only just that there's a vehicle at the, the head of the intersection um, through a loop, but now you can see it in quite uh, granular uh, numbers. So in, in this instance, we're seeing that across Eddy Avenue, the, 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 the combined lanes, are there's a, there's a queue length of 12 metres. Um, and, and perhaps down Pitt Street, there's 20, uh, a queue length of 27 metres. Um, 
And again, this is where we're seeing those new insights out of combining both those sensors and the edge compute. Here at a lane level, we can see how long it takes to clear uh, the lane to go from one side of the road to the other. The fatter the or thicker the um, the line, the, the, the longer it takes. So in this particular example, we've got Pitt Street Lane 10 going to Pitt Street Lane, uh, Pitt Street lane 13, taking uh, three uh, meters per second. Um, Q lengths, on the other hand, uh, we can see that, again, uh, the, the thicker the, the line, the longer the Q length is. So Eddie Avenue Lane 7 to Rawson Place Lane 22 um, is quite thick, and the reason for that is that that's actually the, the lane that the light rail runs on. Same for clearance time per lane, um, how long does it take to clear it, to even stop times. All this is now visible through uh, the, the, the application that we trialled as well. Uh, and then we can see that over time, trending uh, over time uh, as well on a per lane basis. is actually the identification of, of the location of the vehicle as it turned down the road, uh, as it went down the road and turned right. And the blue line, the blue dots is actually coming from uh, the GPS. So that sort of indicates that the level of accuracy that we're seeing with this system, while the GPS is a little bit all over the place. Um, uh, and, and bear in mind, it was going uh, up directly under a bridge, uh, you can see from the red dots that um, the Wi-Fi, the sensors using the Wi-Fi and the Code of Wise Locate IQ is actually quite accurate. Um, we could see that, it, that the correct lane that it's on, um, the fact that it stopped 2.4 seconds for the light to change and then it went down um, Pitt Street. So not, not too bad at all. So in our first uh, iteration of this trial, um, these are sort of the results we're getting. Uh, a leg is, is a road uh, and a lane is self-explanatory, but a leg, we're, we're reasonably accurate on, on Ingress. So 100% uh, there in terms of the correct classification, a little bit down uh, on Egress. Um, and then at the lane level, it was about 81.25% accuracy um, there in getting the correct lane. Uh, egress a little bit further down from there, but you know, reasonably good numbers given this is the first uh, iteration of this trial and, uh, and room to, to optimize uh, clearly as well. So just to round out this discussion uh, and um, looking at this from a, both a horizontal and vertical perspective, uh, we spoke about how now we're using um, uh, more granular high fidelity sensors to detect objects, um, understand behavior, both from an asset uh, perspective, but also from a customer perspective, and then edge computing to help solve some of those challenges around data flow. Uh, that really opens up the door to releasing that data, and then the applications at that top layer are really that next step. What do you do with that data to drive outcomes um, and, and make decisions? And that's really where we're at in terms of um, evolving this as a, as a solution. But that's from a vertical perspective. We can also see this occur from a horizontal perspective as well. We can take that same concept and apply it to vehicles, whether they be light rail or bus or at a taxi rank or a ferry. Um, and so this really lends itself well to understanding the full uh, cluster of vehicles and fleet within a transport system and really enables that integrated transport system to be built and recognize understanding supply and demand and build out that elastic transport system across the board. Um, so thank you for your time and uh, back to Andrea. Perfect. Thank you so much, Simon. I think one of the, the, the um, very interesting, as I know, you know I, I, I know the results from uh, this first trial and, and uh, it's great to um, continue to build upon this. But I think also the other message is what it demonstrates is the importance of collaboration uh, across the different organisations within CITS here with Cisco, with Transport for New South Wales and also with CODA. Okay. 
So now we're going to uh, round it out, do a full circle and come back to Claire, who's going to actually talk about the value of all these insights and what you want to get out of it. And I think it's really about hitting on the power of the integration of this data. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. And a really good point made in terms of it was I've really loved um, listening to both Paul and Simon's um, presentations and also in, in particular demonstrating um, how industry um, and government like Transport New South Wales can come together, I think, for the ITS industry and ecosystem to be really successful. It is um, partnerships are absolutely critical um, to that. It's also great to hear Simon speak to the advantages of edge computing. Um, as experts in traffic management platforms, we're certainly sold on the future use of edge computing um, in SCATs and integrating edge computing and intelligence sensors effectively to drive outcomes for us is fundamentally important and something that we're very much focused on right here, right now as part of the rebuild of um, of SCATs and our, and our core product offering. Um, it's, as many of the industry know, it is due for, for a massive overhaul and um, we've been busily working behind the scenes for the last 12 plus months on starting to execute that rebuild program. The new SCATs, what we're, we're calling SCATs Beyond, um, will be built um, rebuilt, I should say, using advances um, in edge computing technology. And on screen is a bit of a visualisation of what we see the future will look like. Um, future SCATs will deploy SCAT edge devices and confer, convert each traffic control site or traffic signal controller into what we're calling an intelligent control node. Um, and this includes the decision making algorithms and the, de the decision, the core decision making of SCATs will be processed locally in these intelligent, intelligent control nodes at the site. Um, SCATs Edge, or the Edge device that will sit inside um, our future traffic um, controller or our intelligent control node, as we like to call it, um, will include a range of modular software applications or layers responsible for various functionality. One of those layers is the what we're calling the data layer, and that will become a real foundation for SCATs Beyond. It's the data layer that will inside the edge computing device that will be really be responsible for managing the different data sets from the various um, modern and augmented sensors um, that Paul um, uh, has spoken to today, whether that be, um, I know he was speaking about Locate IQ, hopefully I got the name of that right, but you know, the range of modern traffic sensors, whether that's cameras, LiDAR, Bluetooth, uh, and connected vehicles when they become sensors in their own right um, in the future. The data layer will ingest, um, process and supply the data um, with uh, to other layers within the intelligent control node, as well as third-party applications and system other systems via cloud-based technology um, into the future. As a team, we've evaluated a range of um, edge computing devices on the market, including Cisco's, um, and deployed these um, on a key corridor in Sydney together with our data layer platform. So we've actually built. Um, a data a data platform which we're calling um, fabric um, if you work in my team everything must have a name so um, don't expect you to remember all of those from my presentation however so the edge device and the data layer um, combined a process are currently processing um, data from radar and thermal sensors which were deployed out on that main corridor which I spoke to uh, the trial has been working successfully for over six months and we're currently evaluating um, how the edge computer and the platform are working together and what are some opportunities that we need to refine. We're really keen to take the lessons from this trial um, together from a range of other trials that Transport is running, including uh, the trial that Simon referenced on, on Pitt Street, so we can really harness all of those collective learnings um, and feed that into the ongoing rebuild process um, of SCATs. 
we're still assessing um, what augmented sensors are fit for purpose and in, in which scenario, um, as not all sensors are the same. And I think to, uh, to Paul's point around um, granularity um, and fidelity, there, there are certainly um, uh, sensors on the market that offer less granularity um, and then there's those that offer more, but then there's the element of cost um, which comes to it. And importantly, we want to make sure um, we're investing in sensors um, that, that are future-proof um, because it will be a fairly significant investment across the network. So on that, Paul and Simon, we should probably uh, talk a little bit more um, about how we can continue to work together. Um, Post-evaluation of, of uh, um, the edge computing device working in with our data platform and importantly, um, assessing the sensors as I spoke to, our focus will really then turn to, well, how is it that we can leverage um, those data, that, 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 that enhanced um, data? Importantly, um, the value of the data will come when we can integrate that into, into the algorithms that make SCAPs work the algorithms that help inform the changing of phases and the movements across our across corridors um, and across the, the entire network. If we're not integrating that data into our algorithms, then in my mind, it's just a lot of nice data. Um, so that's where, um, you know, my algorithm engineers and my data scientists, they'll be sort of working very hard over the next six plus months um, to ingest, use, utilise um, the data to enhance um, and perhaps even develop a whole new set um, of algorithms that will support SCATs beyond. I think this is a really um, exciting time for us as, as SCATs. I'm looking forward to sharing um, more progress with you, including um, more progress as we continue to work in with Coda and Cisco um, and importantly, our other um, industry partners um, we really want to um, so ensure that we've got a large scale deployment of new SCATs, um, SCATs beyond leveraging uh, edge computing, new high fidelity intelligence sensors right across New South Wales, but importantly for all of our SCATs customers in the next, in the next few years. And that's that's it for me. I think we'll we'll round out there and I'll hand back to our lovely moderator, Andrea. Perfect. Thank you so much, Claire. Now let me see if I can find my video. Perfect. Okay, we're all back on. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Paul. I think it was um, uh, a, a great presentation on understanding the current challenges that, that uh, happen. Uh, on our roadways and also offering solutions on how we can prove this in the future. I kind of summarise it as we was going through it. It's really, you know, the power of, the power of high fidelity data, the power at the edge, the power of integration, and also we're thinking about the power of how we plan for the future as well. So thank you for the presentations. I think this is the perfect time now to um, go to our live uh, question and answer time and uh, we can start taking questions that have been sent through uh, throughout the conversation. So thank you.